Hi, uh, my name is Raj Ramalingam. So I'm with Salesforce working on Airflow. Varun, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Varun, and I help build uh, Airflow as a service here at Salesforce, and we are happy to be presenting at this conference. So this talk will be useful for people who wants to manage Airflow at scale. So this is a forward-looking statement. Um, our legal team has asked us to share this. Basically, all it says is you cannot make any purchase decisions based on what we see here. We know that it is a technical conference. Let's move on. Varun and I are here to share our journey. So before we talk about outline, let's set some uh, terminology correct. So when we say tenant or customers, so we mean internal tenant. When we say service or service instance, we mean one Airflow instance. So let's go through the outlines. So it helps the audience to follow through the materials. Let's understand the landscape first, key architectural components, and how did we productionize them, and conclusion and takeaways. Understanding the landscape. So we have a several petabyte scale data lakes. And one of the data lake we have about 70 plus teams, 900 plus users, uh, they are all using Airflow for their orchestration needs. Let's take a look at the data platform view and the use cases and tools. So typical use cases that we allow are ETL, ELT type that comes from data engineers. The other use cases are ML use cases with some dependencies associated with that. The other use cases, one-off data analytics use cases where data scientists or engineers would come into the platform and explore the data using the tool sets that you see and then make them as a DAG and put them onto a scheduler for regular execution cadence. Let's take a look at the data processing engines, Spark, Snowflake, Trino, Tableau, uh, many other data processing engines. They are all multi-tenant. They all have their own authentication and authorization. And there are some are MPLS, Kerberos, SPIF, and OPA based. Let's focus more on what Salesforce Airflow is. What is Salesforce Airflow? So we've taken open source Salesforce, uh, Apache Airflow and then added a bunch of services on top of it. So I would want you to focus more within the box. So anything and everything we do is based on trust and security. And that's why we have integrated with Salesforce operated PKIs and then approved secrets managements. Any jobs or anything that we run from Airflow is, is, is based on the standard service accounts that's given to a team. Deployment services. These, these are opinionated GitHub services um, that we have developed on top of the Airflow. And these services will help data engineers persona to move their DAGs or scripts into the ecosystem, or if they have any dependencies that they want to bring into the cluster, they should be able to do that. SF Airflow operators. So we've taken the open source operators, typically Levi, Trino, and many others, whatever the processing engines that we have, and then added additional abstraction, light abstraction over it to provide contextual messages about you know where your queries and jobs are running so this would help data engineer persona to debug more effectively these operators gets distributed through the deployment services and anytime we change, make any changes it gets uniformly distributed across different instances if you have a need to execute your dag from other instances you could do it through an event service hyperforce is our a uh, public cloud technology framework that provides all kinds of cross-cutting services for us. So what is Salesforce Airflow? So when we started up, we had specific goals in mind. Number one is security and trust. And then we wanted to provide a productive environment for users, and they want to come in, bring in their DAG, or any other executables. They should be able to run them with no time. It should be easy to onboard without any configurations at all. So what did we do? This is what we came up with, a pre-configured 
productive production environment. So if you have a simple DAG, it's going to work fine. If you look at these instances, your security configurations, deployment services, operators, everything is being primed within that instance. All of your data, data connections are set up, and you can just bring in your DAG. Everything is going to work fine seamlessly. There are no changes required. Well, what if you have a complex DAG that has a lot of configurations with other systems? How do we do that? So we provide another, another instance, Sandbox instance, the high fidelity between prod and Sandbox. If we can test everything on Sandbox with a similar setup, it's going to work on prod. So how would that view look like? This is what you, you the tenant can bring in the repo or bring in the Docker image. You should be able to run them. Well, what if we have a DAG that depends on another DAG that lives in another instance? How do we do this? You can do this in one of two ways. Number one, you can exchange API keys, or you can keep poll for it. Whether it's a short polling or long polling, that's not a best practice. You're going to keep wasting resources on the cluster. If you're exchanging API keys, which means the other tenant or other systems can call anything on your anything on your cluster. We don't want that either. So we came up with event service. So what is event service? It is a very simple service, connects things between different systems. From a ten, from a publisher standpoint, you can just publish an event from a receiving standpoint. You can associate your workflow to that particular event. So it makes it easy. So there are it's almost like a low code, no code type of an environment. These typical use cases, as I said, if you have a DAG that depends on a job, or if you have a DAG that depends on a data, you can do that. We can also perform fleet-wide updates across, across the board. One event from our standpoint, we can update things. So at this point, you can think everything is like a microservices. Everything is like microservices interacting with each, each other through an API, and the event service is there to connect things up. So if you need to trigger something from external systems, send a signal through an event service. It will exactly connect to the particular workflow, and then you can execute them. Not the entire thing. So it, you, can, you can say that all these are like, at this point, services interactions, service instances and interactions. So how would that look like at runtime? The whole thing is built based on the zero trust architecture. What does that mean? So every container that it's going to come up with, it will have a unique identity. Those unique identities, workload identity, through that, the receiving service can understand where the call is coming from. Are you really entitled to allow that call or not? So this way, there is a least privilege access policy is across from caller to the sender. Just because all these services lives within the same cluster doesn't mean that the request is flowing from one service to the other service. The security, security is enforced at every layer. Having said all of this, some of the key decisions and capabilities that we have built over a period of time. So let's look at them one by one. Number one, Kubernetes executor. So we have, before we zeroed it on Z, uh, Kubernetes Executor, we have looked at uh, Keda. We have looked at uh, Celery Executor. So both of them has its own pros and cons. But Celery Executor, on the other hand, we have to come up with the capacity planning. We do not know about our, our customer's workload. It could be, uh, depending on one customer, it could be many or it could be low. So that's not the right fit for us. Keda was totally new at that point. It wasn't proven. So we went with Kubernetes Executor. It seemed to fit the bill for most of the use cases from a security standpoint, because any container that it's going to come up with, it will have a unique identity. So that, that makes sense for us. The whole thing is built based on the approved Salesforce approved Docker images. And we also associate an infrastructure logging. Basically, all the web servers, schedulers, Kubernetes executors will flush out the logs through a common place. What if you are a data engineers want to associate a particular KPA to your DAGs 
or the task? How do you do that? We also distribute the observability plugins. So this way you can send metrics to the systems and then you can also associate an alert to that. If any KPA is breached, you can uh, you, you can trigger an alarm based on your, your own KPIs. So this way, this promotes a right level of service ownership in a distributed world, things expected to fail. If there are any failures from a data engineer persona, it is he can start off with this way, things fail, and then drill down from that point. If there are any system failures, the people whoever manages the airflow, they'll come to know actually what really triggered, what things gets moved. Because we keep patching operating system all the time, things get shuffled within clusters all the time. So things are expected to fail. Finally, Salesforce Airflow operators. These are standard operators. Customer can bring in their own, but these are already proven in a way that tested by the team and distributed across all different instances. Whenever there is new, you will get a new, uh, new, new plugins through our deployment services that what we have developed. Finally, the whole thing is exposed through a proper API, and then you can connect them through an event service. This is a very complex architecture when you have to operate this at a scale. So that Varun is going to talk about. Varun, do you want to take it over? Oh, thanks, Raj, uh, for um, setting the context on uh, why we do what we do and why we ended up building our um, custom managed Airflow service here at uh, Salesforce. Uh, now we will uh, switch gears a little bit and take a look at the how side of things. Uh, we will take a look at our uh, architectural pieces, how they interact with each other. We will see how we operationalize this architecture through uh, user journey and conclude with uh, takeaways from the presentation. Um, one thing to note here is that when we talk about architecture, uh, we will concentrate on the building blocks that help us build a managed service versus looking uh, deeper, delving deep into uh, specifics of airflow itself. Moving on. Right, so this is a pic uh, picture of our uh, high level architecture. Um, so, like Raj was mentioning earlier, we exclusively run on Kubernetes on Hyperforce, which is our public cloud infrastructure. Uh, we operate on the model of uh, namespace based multi tenancy. So, what this means is every tenant of uh, uh, Salesforce Airflow gets its own namespace and it's isolated from all other tenants via namespace based isolation. Uh, further, each tenant is associated with its own uh, metadata database and a shared file system. Um, this shared file system is used to process tax independencies and so on. Um, we also integrate with our in-house SSO uh, systems for uh, authentication, and we use Airflow's our backup for uh, authorization. Um, in addition, we establish federated identities uh, using MTLS or Kerberos to talk to external computer and storage systems. Uh, we interact with our in-house secrets management service called Vault, where we store all of Airflow's secrets as well as uh, provide uh, uh, location for customers to store their secrets. Uh, we integrate with our logging, monitoring, and alerting uh, frameworks that, that have been built in-house. Moving on. Right, so like Raj was mentioning earlier, trust is our number one value. Um, so which means uh, we are required to operate at a high level of availability uh, to be able to scale when there is load without uh, any visible impact to the service and be resilient to uh, failures across the board. Um, so to that effect, we are required to promise uh, four lines of availability. Uh, to achieve all of this, uh, this is kind of the architecture that we go with. All our web server and scheduler deployments run across three availability zones. Uh, what this means is if, if two of the three availability zones go down, the service is still operative and uh, you know the users uh, of the service uh, are, uh, are, are not uh, disturbed or uh, you know, interrupted in any way. Um, we use Kubernetes Autoscaler for all of our scaling needs. So all the instances that that um, that run on the Salesforce F4 cluster are part of an autoscaling group, which is controlled by the Kubernetes Autoscaler. And as workers come in and load increases, the Autoscaler kicks in and increases 
uh, the size of the cluster and brings it down as needed. In addition, we associate a horizontal pod autoscaler with schedulers uh, for load-based autoscaling of the scheduler pods. Right. Talking about logging, monitoring, and alerting. So we rely on our in-house monitoring infrastructure for a lot of these. Um, so we push in events that come in from the cloud native infrastructure as well as the Airflow infrastructure. Now these events coming from the Airflow infrastructure could be uh, events that the Airflow service itself is pushing in terms of heartbeats and so on, um, and custom events that users uh, might be might push from their DAGs for their use cases. So all of these events are funneled through the ingestion endpoints, uh, the, Propagate to a bunch of uh, Kafka clusters and various uh, aggregations are performed on them. So we are then also provided with a bunch of dashboarding, visualization, and analytics tools uh, for monitoring and reporting on the service. Uh, we interact. We, interact uh, we also integrate with a bunch of alerting tools such as PagerDuty. So we we are promptly alerted when there's something uh, wrong with the service and and so that we can jump in and and fix what's needed. Moving uh, on. Right. So now we looked at a lot of the pieces that make up our architecture. Now we'll take a look at how um, we put all of these into motion through a user journey. Um, yes. So um, right. So uh, our user journey uh, is interesting in that when we started uh, building the product, we realized that we have various classes of users, not only in terms of their personas, but also in terms of their uh, savviness specifically with Kubernetes, with Airflow, and in in general the whole development environment, right? So, so, so what we had to do was come up with uh, high level steps that kind of are generic enough so it fits all of these use cases, but be able to provide uh, customizations on each of these steps so we could tailor them to to specific um, uh, customer needs. Um, so, uh, in doing so, we came up with these four major steps as a part of a user journey. The first step is um, developing DAGs, which is pretty simple uh, in that the developers go on their local or dev instances and use their favorite code editors to build their DAGs, push them using CLI, test it out, and when they're happy, they check it in to Git repositories. The next step in the process is sourcing DAGs. So we've built in GitHub style pipelines that, that kind of automatically pull in uh, DAG updates uh, from from our cloud storage and refresh it on the cluster. Um, the next step is sourcing dependency. So, so some DAGs might depend on various libraries and packages and so on for their functioning. So we have integrated, uh, uh, we have built pipelines that pull some of these dependencies uh, from places like container registries, PyPy, uh, artifactories, and so on, and bring them onto the cluster. Uh, and now finally that we have DAGs and dependencies on the, on the cluster, uh, users can go execute their workflows either manually uh, from the UI uh, or schedule it via cron or uh, asynchronously via the event service. Uh -huh. yeah. Let's take a little bit of a deeper look into how the DAG sourcing process works. Um, so also users write their DAGs committed to Git repositories, which then flows through our CI system, which does a bunch of checks and validations and so on. And eventually, uh, you know, the DAG uh, repo lands in cloud storage. So we have built GitHub style jobs that pull this cloud storage uh, for update to DAG repos. And every time there is an update uh, that it sees, it pulls in uh, the latest copy of these DAGs and uh, persists it on the shared file system. Uh, this way, a consistent view of the latest copy of the DAGs is available to all our components, namely the scheduler, web server, and our worker pods. Going on. Right, so uh, we briefly spoke about the different uh, personas and the uh, savviness of our users. Um, so one class of users, like the uh, data scientists and the uh, ML engineers, so uh, a lot of them are not really, uh, you, you know, do not want to worry themselves with with figuring out dependencies and, and building their own containers and configuring them. All They're looking for some sort of an automated management of dependencies in that all they want to do is assume that the dependencies that they need are on the cluster and they can just write their DAGs assuming that 
these dependencies are there. So to that effect, we've built in um, GitHub style pipelines using what we call the dependency distributor, which is essentially a, a Docker image that the users would inherit and add their dependencies on top of this image. And uh, what we do is we have GitHub style jobs again that look at the container registries and pull in uh, a new copy of this dependency uh, image whenever there's an update and refresh the file system with these dependencies. Now the users um, can kind of be oblivious to the fact that there's this pipeline bringing all these dependencies and and just just assume that you know the dependencies are going to be located um, in certain locations and build the DAG space on that. Um, going on. Right. So uh, the other class of users that, that we work with are the more savvy kind who want um, you know, an increased level of customization um, on their environments. They want to be able to control what kind of, uh, you know, versions of Python, for example, they run, uh, configure their environments, resources, and so on. So for these use cases, we use the Kubernetes pod operator. All we ask in this case is that they, or, uh, they inherit uh, an Airflow-based image that we give them and customize it as much as they need. And uh, the scheduler just runs the worker pod with, with this custom uh, Docker images that kind of you know spin up the environments that they need, and there are workflows around there. Uh, going on, right? So now that we took a look at the various components that make up our architecture and yes, various steps through our user journey, let's conclude with some uh, takeaways from the presentation. Uh, the goal in building uh, Salesforce Airflow for us was to um, provide Airflow easy at scale. Um, so when I say scale, um, it's actually you know significant in that uh, we have about 70 plus tenants, uh, 120 plus instances, 6,000 plus tags, and growing. Um, this combined with uh, our various um, other initiatives around government clouds and so on makes it a very large uh, undertaking. Um, so our focus here has been uh, to build managed everything so that the users of Salesforce Salesforce can just plug in their DAGs and be up and running. Um, so to that effect, you know, we built on the number one value of trust uh, natively on Hyperforce. Um, and our goal here is to provide a flexible, scalable, and automated orchestration system for all of Airflow's internal orchestration needs. Um, and that is the end of presentation. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Uh, and we are around for questions. Thank you.